Well, good morning, everybody. How have you been? How was your week? Did you accomplish, you know, did you accomplish something really huge, really momentous this week? You know, maybe somebody did. Did you do something that you're absolutely thrilled with, absolutely proud of? Are you coasting into this weekend feeling like a million bucks? I'm Dan Hansen, and you're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And I don't know about you, but I had a momentous, momentous week this week. It was absolutely huge. Uh, the highlight, the highlight, my big accomplishment uh, was my daughter. Uh, she mentioned a few days ago that she needed to go shopping for new church pants. And honestly, that scared me. You know, she's not easy to shop for. Uh, she's got a very definite style that she likes, but I'm not sure she even knows what it exactly is. You know, she knows it when she sees it. It's that kind of thing. And, you know, I can walk into a store and I can pick out clothes in five minutes. It's like a superpower. I'm that good. You know, I've got a trick. And my trick is I don't care how I look. You know, as long as the pants don't need to be rolled up. That sometimes is a trick to find pants that will work. But if I can find pants that don't need to be rolled up, and as long as my belly, you know, doesn't poke out underneath the edge of my shirt, I figure I'm styling. I'm looking pretty good. At least as good as I'm going to look. Well, my daughter's not that way. She's picky. And so when she needed me to help her, help her shop, I was concerned. You know, I do remember other shopping trips full of tears and stress. Uh, some of that was hers. Most of it was mine. You know, the, the trick questions that they give, you know, I, I'm especially thinking about women uh, when we're shopping with them. But, you know, I'll get questions like, does this outfit highlight the fact that I'm short? Now, how do you answer that? If you parse it and really think about it, you see there's no good answer. I normally don't think that far ahead. And I just remember when that, that question literally came up and I came up with the answer, no, no. Well, instantly, you know, of course, tears came because anybody out there thinking and listening knows I implicitly agreed with the premise that she really was short. Now, I tried to dig my way out of that. I remember that. But if you've listened to this show any length of time, you know that digging out of something like that is not probably going to be my strong suit. So those are my memories uh, of shopping experiences. Lots of things like that. And so I was nervous to do it again. But this time, I've got to tell you, I am happy to report that I nailed it. I sent her off to the little dressing rooms and I had her decide what she thought. You know, then when she'd come out, I would read her expression and I'd lean into that. You know, I used color talk that I pick up at work, and I'd say things like, those brown corduroys, they really create a nice ambiance with your hair. You know, things like that. She'd roll her eyes, which was better than crying, and then we'd keep shopping. Eventually, we found pants. Not that anybody cares, but, you know, this was big to me, so I'm going to recount it all play by play, uh, moment by moment. We found pants, and because I've raised her so well, we found those pants on the clearance rack. Absolutely Thrilled about that. The clearance rack, and not just a, any clearance rack, this clearance rack allowed you to get a second pair of pants for free. It was heaven on a Sunday on a Wednesday. We hung out at the mall, uh, found girl clothes that she loved, and we had fun along the way. So it was great. I had all of that pre-shopping stress for no reason at all. So anyway, I am riding high today, and I'm carrying all of that into the show. And I'm going to give you the best show I know how to give. Um, at the end, we're going to be talking about air nailers, electric nailers, and battery-powered nailers. Uh, we highlighted air nailers a couple weeks ago, but I did want to throw some light on some alternatives. Uh, so we'll dig into that. I'm also going to be sitting down and talking about trends in countertops with Village Custom Interiors. You know, what's trending, what's cool, what's economical. Uh, we'll dig into all of that and a ton more. But right now... Let's get to the paint point for the week, and it's really straightforward and simple, and yes, I do want to say that about two months ago or so, we talked about some of this, but here's the deal, and before I get going, I've got to take a big swig of water here, getting a little dry with my throat, and there's a lot to tell that's pretty fun. <sighs> refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. All right, here's the deal. Last week, a friend of mine, Allie Bride from Mustard Seed Beginnings, was on our show, on this radio show, talking about a hardwood floor refinishing project that she just tackled. Now, if you missed that segment last week, Allie does all kinds of design work in her home. You know, she'll jump into pretty much any project. And then she shares her journey on Instagram, Facebook, her blog, 
and so on. You can find her, if you want to, by searching Mustard Seed Beginnings. Anyway, this past week, Allie was working in a different room, you know, painting the walls, and she made a huge mistake. Huge mistake. She posted about it, so and I told her I was going to talk about it. I told her I wouldn't use her name. She said, oh, everybody's going to know anyway because she talked about it on her Instagram. So I'm just using her name. I don't think she cares. She, she had fun with it. But she posted about this mistake, and that's how I ran into it. You know, I was sitting here working. A little notification came up on Instagram. I'm watching her video, and what, what happened was she was painting the walls in a carpeted room, the carpet that's going to stay there. She's not intending to remove that carpet. She removed other carpet for that hardwood flooring project, but this carpet's staying. You know, someday it'll go, but not yet. No, she needs that carpet to look good. So as she's painting that room, she's got a plastic paint tray on the floor, and she's carefully, you know, scooching it along. She gets nearly done with the room, and that's when she realizes there's a crack in the tray, and dark blue paint has been dripping out slowly, leaving a number of little dime-sized spots all around the room on her carpet. Well, seeing that, she panicked, grabbed a rag, and started trying to dab up the paint, you know, scrub it up. But instead, she ended up smearing it into larger, you know, dinner plate size spots all around the room. And then she ran to the internet and gave it a quick goog and was greeted by a number of suggestions from the Google, including things like get some paint thinner and go after it with nail polish remover. Now, she was explaining all of those things uh, in her little Instagram page, on her page, in a little story when I, I, that's when I, that's what I was watching. I quit watching immediately at that point and texted her, are you still dealing with this? Because don't do any of the things that you've just found on the internet to do. So I thought it's going to be a perfect paint point. Let's figure out what the right way is to deal with paint spills. And as I said earlier, I talked about this a few weeks or so ago, and some of this is going to be repeated info, but it's good info. And in the heat of the moment, you know, we don't always remember everything. So it's good to hear it again. And the hope is here that more people will just lock this into your brains. So paint spills. First thing I want to talk about, you know, especially specifically referencing Allie's uh, situation. First thing I want to talk about is prevention. You know, what's the old saying? Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, something like that. Well, prevention, it's a big deal. So first thing, that you want to do to prevent this from even happening to you is use a drop cloth on every paint project that you tackle. You know, that alone could help save people from so many minor paint disasters. You know, just having that drop cloth down. In this situation, you know, Allie's situation, a good canvas drop cloth probably would have captured all of those paint drips completely, and there would have been no issues for her to deal with at all. So get a good drop cloth, and I really do recommend a canvas one. They're more expensive, you know, than the plastic throwaway ones, and they're more expensive by a fair amount, you know, no kidding. They're, they're not inexpensive by any means, but they are nicer to work with. You know, they're easier to spread out, easier to walk on, because they're not slippery like the plastic is. And from my point of view, you know, my favorite thing about the canvas drop cloths is that they're not disposable, which means when I buy one, I've got one. You know, it's mine now. It's not going to go away. And that means when I tackle that next project that I didn't realize I was going to be doing today, you know, those projects that kind of sneak up on you and all of a sudden you jump in because the timing seems right. Well, when I do that, I've got the drop cloth on hand, ready to go. And when I've got it, I am way more likely to use it. If I don't have it, you know, I know I can run out and I can get one. I can get a cheap one. But will I? You know, I know me. I'm probably not going to run out and get one. I'm going to try to wing it. I'm going to try to get by, and that's when things go wrong. So get a good drop cloth. And with the canvas ones, last thing I'll say about them, there are 4 by 15 foot runners, you know, just little narrow runners. They're economical, way cheaper than the big full drop cloths, and that runner might be all you need for most of your projects. I use mine all the time, so go grab one and use it. Second prevention step, use good metal trays and tray liners. You know, the plastic trays like Allie was using are good for periodic use, but they're definitely, you know, more likely to crack than a metal tray would be. They're, they're not much cheaper than a good metal tray is. So really, unless it's just, you know, a one or two use situation and you're going to toss it, I'd probably just, I'd, I'd go get the metal tray. And then spring for that tray liner. You know, the little tray liners that drop in there. Do that because it makes cleanup so much easier uh, because all you need to do is toss that liner when you're done. 
Now, those two things right there would probably have helped Allie completely avoid her mess. But there are a few other prevention things to keep in mind on your next project. Do the first things I mentioned. And then number three, make sure that you always put the lid securely back on the paint can after you pour your paint into the tray. Don't just lay it on top of the paint can. You know, my kid worked with a painter this summer and he said one of the key mistakes he saw happen all the time, uh, you know, with the crew is that somebody would set the lid on the can of paint. They would just set it on top. It looks like the can's closed. Somebody else would walk by and grab it. Somebody would walk by and bump it with their foot and the paint would go all over the place. Looks like it's sealed up, but it's not. Trust me, you will trick yourself. I did that working in the paint store. I worked at the Lakewood Repco Light in Holland for 10 years or more, 10, 12 years, something like that. And not many times did I spill paint all over the place, but a couple of times I did really badly. And those times were times where I had finished tinting a gallon of paint or color matching, you know, added some color to it, put the can on the counter, set the lid on top. Somebody called me away to do something else. I ran over there to help with whatever it was. It was like a little superhero over there, always helping, Mr. Helpful. That's what I like to call myself. Anyway, I'm busy doing whatever, and I come back, and I see the lid on the paint can on the counter, and I just forgot. I never whacked it down with the hammer. I would grab it to write, you know, flip it on its side so I could write the formula on it. What a mess. Poured paint, you know, full gallon of paint all over a counter is definitely not a way that you want to spend any time of your day, and that's just at work. That's not my stuff. Don't do that at home. Put that lid on and whack it down tight. Super important. All right, couple other things. When you're painting a room, clear the space out ahead of time. You know, you want to give yourself room to work without bumping into furniture. That's going to help you a ton. And then finally, last thing, have a plan in case of a paint spill. Knowing what you're going to do in case something bad happens is huge. And we're going to get to what that plan is after we take a quick break. So stick around and we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to the Repcolite Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And in the last segment, we talked about some things to do to prevent a paint spill. Now, in this segment, let's talk about what you need to do if you do, won't, 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 if you do spill paint all over your floor. And let's look at this specifically from the perspective of my friend Allie. And I explained it all last segment, but the short story, if you missed that, is that Allie had a few dime-sized paint spills on her carpet, you know, after she finished painting a room recently. She tried to remove them or to minimize them with a dry rag, and she only made them worse, you know, like 10 times worse. She spread them to the point where they were like dinner plate sized. Then she went to the internet looking for help, and the first suggestions that she encountered were to use paint thinner, and then if that doesn't work, it's time to break out the nail polish. All right, that's the scenario she was dealing with. That's the scenario we're dealing with. Let's fix the spill. And first thing, when you're dealing with a paint spill, the most important thing is response time. Don't delay. You know, don't wait to finish rolling out the wall. Don't give it a few minutes and then get on it. The right thing to do is to act immediately. Now, I know that may sound crazy that I've got to say that, but you'd be surprised how many people don't sense the urgency here. Don't be those people. Sense the urgency. Sense it in a big way. Get moving on it right away because once the paint starts to dry, removing it completely becomes much, much more difficult. So it's important to act right away. Now, first thing that I would do with a paint spill is actually kind of a cheat. It's a preliminary step. It's like a prep step. It's not prevention. Otherwise, I would have talked about it last segment, but it is kind of you know preliminary. Whenever I start a paint project, I make sure that I've got the proper thinning agent ready to go. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying I've probably got water sitting there. You know, in most instances, the thinning agent of the paint that we're using in our homes is going to be water. If you're using latex paint, water-based paint, acrylic paints, water is going to be what you use to clean up spills. And if you do have any question at all about, you know, what you would use for the paint that you're working with, just check the label on the can. It's going to tell you right there what you need to use to clean up your brushes and rollers that's the product that you would use in case of a spill. Now, generally, whenever I start a paint job, one of my initial steps, that preliminary step, that prep step, is to get a bucket of clean water and some fresh rags, and I just keep them handy just in case. I assure you, from experience, running through the house, you know, to grab all of those things, the bucket of water and the rags, running through the house to get those things when you're panicking, it's usually a recipe for a disaster. You know, relationships relationships usually end up getting stressed to their limits in those situations because you're shouting things that are, you know, 
incoherent, I guess, is probably the best way to say it. And you're mad because nobody seems to understand the terrified, incoherent babble that's coming out of your mouth. So skip that whole panic thing and that relationship bridge burning thing and just have some water and rags ready to go when you start a paint project. You're, you're going to end up using them for little mistakes that you make you know, during the project. And if something really bad happens, you, you're, you've got them ready to go and it's going to help you a lot. Now, if you do spill paint onto the carpet, let's get to actually dealing with the spill when it happens. If you spill paint onto the carpet, you need to immediately remove as much of it as you can carefully. You know, don't wipe it with a rag or, or you're going to end up spreading it around. Instead, dab at it if it's a small amount. If it's a little bit larger spill, you know, even quarter sized or so, and, and there's paint, you know, kind of puddled there. Uh, get some flat pieces of cardboard, you know, maybe a wide putty knife or two, anything that you can use to carefully scrape over the carpet and kind of scoop off or squeegee off as much of that puddled paint as possible. So get that off. And once you've done that, then you come at that spot with some water. And you're not going to go crazy here. You're not bringing divine judgment, you know, in the form of a flood onto your carpet. Just pour some out of a cup or whatever onto the spill. And then when you've done that, you've got a couple options. The best option, absolute best option, is to vacuum up that spot with a wet dry vac. And once you've done that, reapply a little more water, work it in with your fingers, you know, being careful not to spread the spill further over the carpet, work it around a little bit and then vacuum it up again. Now, when you're vacuuming, go easy on your carpet. You're kind of dabbing at it with the vacuum nozzle and you're lightly dragging it over the spot. Now, if you go nuts with the vacuum, you can damage the twist of the fibers and you don't want to do that. So anyway, keep applying a little bit of water and then vacuuming the spot up. And then probably in about two or three applications, you know, two or three times of doing that, uh, if it's a reasonably small spill and you got on it quickly, you're probably going to have most of it up at that point. Uh, if you don't have a wet dry vac, you can dab at the spot with a clean rag after you apply that first little bit of water. You know, just carefully dab it. Don't scrub the carpet or you're going to spread the spot a lot further and you could damage the fibers. Just dab at it with a clean rag and then reapply the water. Keep doing this until you get it clean. Now, that will work. Uh, it just takes a little bit longer uh, than the shop vac or the wet dry vac would, which is really one of my reasons for always, always, always including a wet dry vac in any list of must-have paint tools. You know, make sure you've got one for those projects. Now, one thing, from experience, don't use that vacuum to clean out the cold, you know, the cold soot from your fireplace and then go and spill paint later that day and then use that same vacuum, at least not without cleaning off that nozzle. You know, I did that one time, one single time. And that time I made my paint spill 10 times worse by going at it with this soot-stained vacuum nozzle. So keep that in mind. Make sure the vacuum's clean. Uh, if you wait too long and the paint ends up starting to dry or it's really stubborn, you could always try hotter water, certainly not boiling water, just hotter water from the tap, and possibly add in some ammonia. Ammonia is going to dissolve latex paint, and that might help. You could also try a steamer if you happen to have one. You know, same process with the rags and shop back that we talked about earlier. Just use the steamer to introduce the water and then shop back it up. Spilling paint in your carpet, it's a major bummer when you're working on a project, but it's not the end of the world. You know, at least it doesn't have to be. Now, I've got more info in the show notes, and keep your eye on Repcolite social media pages, Instagram, Facebook, as well as the Repcolite Home Improvement Show's Facebook and Instagram pages. Uh, check those out. Keep, keep your eye on them, because I've got a quick video that I shot demonstrating this entire process, and I'm going to be dropping that early next week on those pages. All right, that's the long-winded paint point for the week. Now we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking countertops with Village Custom Interiors. Stick around. And we're back. You're listening to the Repcolite Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And right now I'm on site at Village Custom Interiors, and I want to get a bunch of countertop questions answered. Actually, two countertop questions. Let's not overblow the story here. I'm here with Mark Prime. Mark, you were on a few weeks ago, and we talked about cabinets. Thanks for letting me come back to your conference room and ask you more questions. Absolutely. We enjoy it. Now, Village Custom Interiors, uh, what do you guys all do? I mean, you do cabinets, you'll do countertops, flooring. Yeah, we, we do 
really anything that has to do with with home construction on the interior side. Um, we'll do tile work. You know, a lot of backsplashes, floors, showers, um, countertops. We have quartz, laminate, um, cabinetry, wood floor, LVP. Um, All kinds of stuff. Yep. And they've got a great showroom in Byron Center. And coincidentally, ironically, interestingly enough, the showroom is directly connected to our Byron Center Repcolite store. There's just a, a doorway between the two. So you can look at all your cabinet stuff, look at your flooring, and then what? go get color samples. Do you let people drag a flooring sample? Like yes, a absolutely. Sample to the color samples rack go back and forth each way. We, we have them take color samples from Repcolite over here and uh, wood floor and carpet samples over there. No, that's, it's really interesting. I mean, it's a great system because it really helps people. I mean, they can do all of that at one time you know get all of those things figured out i know that doesn't help the folks listening on the east side of the state but i'm sure you've got places kind of like that but if you're on the west side man works out pretty well especially if you're near byron center now all right let's talk about counters i got a couple of questions from listeners and i've said it on and on and on for the last few weeks but i'll say it a couple more times yet i'm getting questions from all of you listeners, you're emailing them, you're calling them in, you're texting them in. I mean, they come from all over the place. And I'm bringing them to the experts that we're interviewing. And if you've got questions, home improvement questions, send them to me. Radio at RepcoLite.com is the easiest way to email them to me. They don't have to be about anything in, you know, specifically, just home improvement questions that you've got. I'll find the right experts and get those questions answered. And best of all, if I do use your question on air on any upcoming episode, I'll send you a $25 gift certificate to Repcolite. So it's pretty cool. Got a couple people who are going to get those gift certificates. Let's get to them. And let's start with Sharon. She's got a question uh, where she says, I've got Formica counters right now, but I'm interested in something different like quartz. Can quartz be installed after the Formica has been removed? Or do my cabinets need to be adjusted to make them able to handle the quartz? Does that make sense? Will the quartz be too heavy is what she's getting at. So I think it's a good question. Um, for mica counters, laminate counters, those are the same. It's kind of an interchangeable thing, right? For yeah, absolutely. Like same same product. Kind of thing. Yep. Um, we do a lot of that work. Uh, many houses... You know, 20 years ago, uh, laminate countertops were more the standard, and everybody's standards has gone up over the years, and so quartz is... Okay, well, hold on, Mark, because my ca my counters are still laminate, so my standards have not gone up at all. <laughs> I just want to let you know, that's where I'm at. I'm that person. Sharon is trying to not be that person, so you're saying a lot of people have transitioned from Formica, Formica laminate counters... To quartz. To something else. Yeah. Is there work that needs to be done on those counters, or are they suited to handle the weight, the extra weight of the quartz or whatever? Yeah, actually, it's a pretty easy process. People will come in, um, we'll send somebody out to do a template um, on the countertops, mm -hmm. and then we handle laminate countertop removal and new quartz install, usually the same day they come out remove the from like our laminate countertops and install the quartz. There isn't any additional cabinetry work that needs to be done. The cabinets are fully capable of supporting the quartz. Um, the only exception might be if you had a bar overhang, um, but the quartz fabricators, they'll include brackets to support that. So there's really, there's no extra work involved for the homeowner. Um, it's pretty seamless. Okay, so quartz... Um you know, let's just go off script here. Um, this is nobody's question. I guess I just want to dig into it. The different countertop materials, we still have laminate, but you're not seeing that used a whole lot anymore. Not as common. Not as common. Um, it is It is probably less than half the price of quartz, so people are using it. In that's why I've got it, Mark. <laughs> that's why it's there. In fact, I, I guess that's probably why the previous owners installed it, and I haven't removed it. It's still <laughs> there. I had a realtor come through. Oh, man, I don't remember, three, four years ago. And I don't even think about it. You know, it's my house. I'm sure you've got places in your house. You just don't think about it. It's your home. Yep. And then somebody comes through, and this realtor came through. Just, I needed a price. I needed to know what the house would sell for if I wanted to do that. And she's a friend. She's been on the show. I've, I've called her out for this. But she walked through, and she couldn't. She stopped in my kitchen and just stared at the counters. 
And then she walked through and then she stopped and came back and she said, Dan, why do you have these counters? These, <laughs> these need to be replaced. These need to be. Oh, now I can't look at them the same anymore. But anyway, there's laminate. Some of us do that. <laughs> but um, we got quartz. We talked about that. Is that the next lowest in price? Or I mean, what are the other options out there when it comes to counters? Uh, granite is still an option. Granite? We, yeah. We don't sell much granite anymore. Everything seems to have shifted. People have moved up from granite. They've just Yeah. Granite it. is similar in price, maybe just a little bit less. Um, but quartz is a, just a more modern material. And a lot of the design world is, is more modern right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of lighter whites and grays. And granite is a you know natural product from the earth. And it's more earth tones. So I think from a design standpoint, quartz is more popular in that regard. Um, the other benefit is it's super consistent. So if you go into the showroom and you look at a sample of quartz, that's what your quartz is going to look like where granite, you know, yeah. each one is different. So, you know, it usually involves going to view a slab and, you know, select that slab for your home. All right. So that's, I did want to get to that, but you've covered that already. So the quartz... What I see, the little the little sample that you've got in the showroom, that's what I'm going to get. Yes. Yep. But granite, I need to see a slab, really, because there really be do. all kinds of different things. Yep. Everyone is different. All right. All right. Sounds good. I think that answers Sharon's question. She doesn't need to do anything extra. The counter should be able to support that weight. And let's move on. I've got a question from Gabe. He says, I'm going to be redoing the kitchen. I'm curious about the pros and cons of quartz versus granite versus laminate. I, we covered a little bit of that, but I don't think we really got into tons of the pros and cons of quartz versus granite versus laminate. What do we got, Mark? Okay. Well, laminate's going to be the most cost effective, and it is a very durable product. So I don't want to... It know. looks amazing in the right finish, right? And yeah. there's a lot of different style options out there. There really is. And I actually think it's having a little bit of a comeback. We're seeing it, you know, used in more areas where just the, you know, the uniqueness of the design, the different... I've been talking about it on the show more. Okay. And it's just really driving up the need <laughs> and the desire for more of this this look you know people want my kitchen in their home oh you know, i bet the oak cab you said that sarcastically <laughs> the the 80s oak and i don't even know what color oh this is so embarrassing i don't even know what color my laminate is supposed to be it's kind of mushed to a given color now but i don't think it was that in the beginning because in the corners i can see there was a pattern on it that's how old it is wow i gotta change it it's embarrassing do you have right. avocado green appliances? No, not anymore. Okay. Got rid of those a few year, years ago. <laughs> All right. So laminate is going to give me a good price point. Yes. Um, a lot of different style options, but it's certainly not, not the most common thing that you're seeing right now. There's a lot more common things. So we talked about quartz, some of the benefits. I mean, it, consistency of color, and it's very modern in style. Yep. What else am I gaining with quartz, or with, yeah, quartz. Yeah, with quartz, it's a non-porous material, uh, which people really like. And there's no sealing that needs to be done. It's you know very resistant to any staining. Doesn't crack or chip or um, scratch as easily as granite. So those are the main advantages. So granite needs to be sealed. That's that's more porous. Yes, um, you don't have to seal it a lot. I think there's good sealers out there where you know there's. It might last 10, 15 years, but but it does need to be sealed, and it is a porous material. So I throw a stake on the counter, or the th let's say I didn't do that, because I probably wouldn't do that in real life, and certainly I wouldn't say it on the radio that I did. Let's say I'm thawing a stake on the counter, and the wrapping is kind of goofy, and it kind of oozes out, and there's you know blood or whatever on the counter on granite. Is that not a good thing if it's not been sealed? That can actually penetrate in yes and then it becomes part of my counter for a while yep forever where the quartz is non-porous so there's no risk there what about staining and stuff you can stain granite um and i think you possibly could stain quartz but it's really unlikely okay so i'd have to work at it yeah with the quartz but yep. i could do it maybe right i thought i'd want to but that's going to resist if the 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 food prep or something like that gets on the counter but that could penetrate into the granite, which is strange to think about, but I think a lot of us have run into that. I know we ran into that. I don't remember where we were. We were on vacation, and this was a long time ago, but there was a granite countertop in like the little kitchenette area in the hotel, and the kids, 
I mean, this is 15, 20 years ago. They left a glass of water or pop or something. I think it was just water on the counter, but then it, uh, you know, condensed on the sure. outside and it dripped on the. We p- picked the cup up at the end. There's this big dark ring in the ground. It just evaporated out. But in the beginning, I freaked out, chewed out all the children, <laughs> told them we can never go on vacation again because we're going to have to pay for this expensive <laughs> countertop. And I tend to fly off the handle fast. Granite is going to give you some of those things. Um, very natural look. I mean, that's a plus. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be a man-made, you know, it's not going to give that consistency. You're going to get some natural variants, which people go to natural wood, you know, wood. Sure. For that same reason. You want that that natural beauty. You'll get that with granite. Should probably seal it from time to time. Yep. Quartz, don't need to do that. You're going to get more consistent colors, more chip resistant. Yep. What about price? How do they compare price-wise? Granite is slightly less. Uh, there are, you know, obviously different price groups and variables. So, you know, you could pick, choose a granite that's more expensive than the quartz you're comparing it to. But on the average, granite is slightly less. All right. So let's say a listener comes in or just anybody comes in to your showroom or, or anybody, you know, east side of the state too. stop us out at any showroom. They start talking about granite and you mentioned needing to see a slab. How does that process look? How does how do you handle that here? How do I find a slab to go look at? We work with different fabricators, and um, they have basically a stock supply of slabs. And if you you know choose a certain color granite, um, you can go look at samples there and, and select your piece. All right. Perfect. That sounds good. All right. I've got one more quick question, and I'm going to just... You don't have any idea what this question is, but it's okay. an easy one. I'm curious about backsplashes right now. What do you see trending? You know, We're talking about the countertops. What are you guys putting on the backsplashes in a kitchen? Let's talk about that. The majority of the backsplashes are going to be tile in the kitchen. Um, You can do a full quartz backsplash. It's a little bit more difficult and challenging of an installation. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is kind of a a unique look and um, has its place for sure. But But most of the time it's going to be tile? Yes. And do they go from the counter to the cabinets? Do they? Yes, they go from the counter to the cabinets. So all the way up. Yep. Anything super trendy that you're seeing? Any material with the with the ceramic or the the tile? Um, there's just uh, so many options with ceramic tile. You know, it used to just kind of be like a subway tile brick set, and mm-hmm. you know, and now we'll see different. You know, maybe vertically stacked tiles. Um, there's just really a lot, lot of different lot. options. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, if you have any countertop uh, work coming up, things that you think are, you're going to do in the home, bathroom, kitchen, something like that. A lot of options out there. Uh, swing out to Village Custom Interiors. You can find them online at villageci.com. And they, you've got a contact form there. You've got all kinds of ways to reach out, your phone number. And, yeah, they can get their questions answered and start their process. Yep, we're here to help. Mark, thanks for letting me hang out with you guys and ask you these questions. You bet. My pleasure. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I've got an overview on nailers, corded nailers, cordless nailers, and then we'll take a quick look at pneumatic nailers and help you figure out which one's right for you. That's all coming up next. Stick around. And we're back. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore, and we're in the home stretch here. On this last segment, I want to jump in one more time uh, into a conversation that we've had about nail guns. We looked at, in the past few weeks ago, we looked at the different sizes that they come in, and we helped you figure out which one was right for the things that you do. But when we did that, we really only looked strictly at air nailers, uh, pneumatic nailers. Now let's look at some of the alternatives out there so you can figure out which of those might be right for you. And let's start with corded electric nailers. Uh, This is a small uh, part of the market uh, when it comes to nail guns. A lot of these corded nailers, they're brad nailers or electric staplers, or they're sometimes a combo. You know, I've got one that's a brad nailer, uh, but there are combos out there. So just be aware of that. They're ideal for little things, you know, simple trim work, other small scale projects. The benefits are the fact that they're light, you know, super easy to maneuver in a space. You don't have other extra things to bring with you. You don't have to worry about batteries. You just got the extension cord and the nailer. Uh, They're ready to go the minute you plug them in. There's no downtime waiting for a compressor to kick in or fill up. Uh, They provide consistent power. There's no battery that could run down, things like that. So those are the positives. On the downside, they don't provide an absolute ton of power. They don't provide much power at all, really. You know, they'll do what they need to do, but a lot of the times when I would use mine, you know, and try to stretch it, 
and make it work on surfaces that were probably pushing it a bit, you know, thicker trim, stuff like that. In a lot of those instances, it wouldn't drive the nail all the way into the wood. So I'd have to usually go back with a nail set to countersink all the heads. So a little bit frustrating there. Overall, these corded electric nailers, they're going to be suitable for small scale, you know, DIY projects, light work, stuff like that, not for professionals. They're way cheaper than buying a compressor and a pneumatic nail gun, but don't kid yourself. They're definitely a niche tool for a very specific, you know, small scale situation. All right, now let's look at cordless nailers, you know, battery powered nailers. These have been gaining a ton of popularity over the last little bit because they're convenient and they work really well. They provide much more power than the corded nailers that we just spoke about. And because of that, they're suitable for many, many, many more projects. They'll cover everything from light duty trim work um, all the way up to heavier duty applications. Now, they don't match the power of pneumatic tools for the most demanding projects out there, but for the most part, you know, for most DIY projects and a lot of professional stuff, these are going to work really well. Uh, some of the other pros that I haven't mentioned is that they provide great mobility. I mean, don't really need to say that, but, you know, think about it. You don't need an air compressor. You don't need hoses. You don't need an extension cord. You just grab the nailer and you're good. Uh, this also reduces setup time and downtime is eliminated because you're not waiting for a compressor to pressurize or anything like that. Also, obviously, another great plus or pro is that you don't need to be in a location that has power. So if that's the kind of stuff you do or you find yourself in those situations, this might be perfect for you or would be perfect. It's way better than trying to use an electric nailer or even a compressor out there. If you don't have power, that's one long extension cord. So that's where these really shine. Um, like most corded models, you know, this would be the last thing, last big pro. Um, the, the corded models are, are going to do the same thing, too. They're quieter than pneumatic nailers, all right? Downsides to the battery-powered nailers, the cordless ones. Uh, the downside is going to be the price. Uh, they're typically way more expensive than pneumatic nailers, and I know you can find cheaper ones, but a recognizable brand is usually going to cost you more. And also, if you have other cordless equipment, other battery-powered equipment, you're likely going to want to stay within the brand and line if that's possible with your nailer. And that's going to make the batteries interchangeable in most situations, so that can be a big plus, but it also might mean that you've got to jump into a brand that could be pricier than other ones out there. You know, everything I have at home is DeWalt, and a DeWalt cordless nailer is going to be in the mid-200s or so. I can find cheaper ones, but then I need, you know, the batteries aren't interchangeable, and that would be a deal breaker for me. I want at least to have the benefit of having all these extra batteries that I've got for my other equipment be able to work in the nailer and vice versa. So that would push me into a price bracket that's higher than I would probably want to go. Another downside with these is battery life and replacement expense. You know, the batteries do run down and need charging. That can be a pain, but the battery packs themselves eventually fail and need replacement down the road. And that's usually not inexpensive. Third downside, final downside is weight. They're usually a fair amount heavier than the other options. All right, last nailer that we're going to look at very briefly is the old standby, a pneumatic or air nailer. We already talked about these in previous episodes, um, but they're still regarded as the gold standard when it comes to nail guns. You know, they're going to give you consistent power, speed, and reliability. You've got all of those pros going for you. For the cons, there's really just the additional setup. You know, you've got to set up that air compressor, haul those hoses around. That can be a pain. You've got to tolerate the noise of the compressor kicking on and off and so on. Those would be some of the main uh, downsides. For me, I'd love a cordless nailer, but it's just not worth the extra money for the work that I do. My pneumatic nailer and compressor both priced out lower than a good cordless nailer would have. And now I've got the added functionality, that extra functionality of having the compressor. So many things I can do with that. So for me... That was the answer. What's the answer for you? Well, that's for you to decide. It's America. You get to do it that way. All right, that's all the time we've got. We're going to have to wrap this one up. If you want to catch it again, you can find it online at repcolite.com or really... You can find it as a podcast pretty much anywhere that you go for podcasts. So just search Repco Light Home Improvement Show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and more. Subscribe. You'll never miss another episode. All right. Whatever you do today, make sure paint's a part of it. Have a great weekend, everybody, and I'll catch you next week. I'm Dan Hansen. Thanks for listening.